Okay, we might as well start. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us for this webinar. Um, uh, very exciting. I think we have, we're expecting 200 people to join us today. So uh, we're very pleased with the turnout and uh, we look forward to a really stimulating hour. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking on behalf of Victorian Oral Health Alliance, the Melbourne Dental School for Melbourne University for joining us in this venture. It's great to have a joint webinar together and we really value their support. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which all the lands, the unceded lands on which we all do our work uh, and pay respect to uh, elders past, present and emerging. Uh, just to note that we are recording this and it will be available on our website uh, at a later time. So in the interest of brevity, I'm not going to go any further. I'm going to hand over to the business end of the workshop, hand over to uh, Professor Nancy Baxter. We're really pleased that uh, we've got Nancy with us. And Nancy, as you probably know, is the head of the School of Population and Global Health at the University of Melbourne. Uh, you've probably heard Nancy on the radio uh, in the last while. Uh, she made a great contribution to uh, the fight against COVID. So, um, Given that we're all in lockdown, let's enjoy this one hour of uh, stimulation and thinking about the future of how we tackle the issues in public oral health care. Okay, I'm hand over to you, Nancy. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Tony. And I do think that one of the positive things that has come um, from COVID is our ability to come together uh, in um, on Zoom and in other uh, formats like that, because I think it it, it really is a an equalizer in terms of enabling um, people from anywhere that they work to participate and to not have to take a lot of time off to be able to do so. So it is one of the, the good things. Um, so I'm a colorectal surgeon uh, and we're, today we're talking about how we address Victoria's public health um, dental waiting list. So uh, I'm gonna learn a lot today. Uh, I am very interested in um, service delivery and access to care. That was a, a focus of the health services research that I've done for my career. Um, so I think this is uh, going to be a terrific panel uh, and we're going to have a fantastic discussion. Um, so this will be recorded um, and uh, will uh, likely be posted. So you'll be able to kind of see this conversation later uh, uh, or share it with uh, others who missed it. Um, we will be monitoring the question and answer um, function. So please use it because we, we will elevate um, some of those questions uh, to be answered or as many as we possibly can. Some of them will be answered during the course of, uh, of our um, session. Um, so um, with that, that, I would first like to introduce our um, and, uh, first panelist, which who's John Rogers. John has had over 45 years of experience in public dentistry and community health in Papua New Guinea, Yemen, Vietnam, England, and Australia. John managed the uh, Peninsula Community Health Service from 1985 to 1989, was Principal Oral Health Policy Advisor in the Victorian Department of Health from 1990 to 2019, Secretary of the Public Health Association of Australia's Oral Health Special Interest Group from 2005 to 2020, and is the current uh, Victorian co-convener. He holds BDS, MPH, and PhD qualifications and is a principal fellow uh, at the University of Melbourne Dental School. Um, so, um, John, um, how, how have uh, we gotten here and, and where do we go from here? So let's, let's have an overview from you about where we're at and, and where we can go in the future. Right. Over to you, John. Well, thank you, Nancy. And, uh, Welcome to everyone. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay respects to the elders. Um, yeah, well, my task is in four minutes to um, look at how we got here and where we are now. Um, it's uh, based on some research I've been doing with a colleague and um, I've got a few, few slides. I'll just um, share the screen and then uh, talk, to, talk to those slides. Um, right, yes, this worked before. Um,
All right, we're getting closer. Um, apologies, that's not the one. <laughs> Uh, John, let's, I can share on your behalf if you want. Yeah, let, let's do that, T. Let's yeah, go. Yeah, just into just it. stop sharing and then you just tell me to go click next slide, please. Okay, fantastic. Right, yes. So uh, I've been doing some work um, looking at the history of general public health for the last 50 years with uh, my colleague, Jamie Robertson. Um, and uh, this presentation will just look at um, oral health status, uh, historic waiting times, and, and some funding. And uh, for the rest, you'll have to read the book. So next slide, thanks. So 1970 to 2020, oral health, is it better or worse? Well, the actual answer is both. Um, there's been some incredible improvements in the uh, oral health of children in 1970 over 90% of uh, five to ten year olds had signs of tooth decay it's down to now 45% uh, but that's still four times as prevalent as asthma uh, there's less hospitalizations of young children for uh, dental care but it's still the highest potentially preventable hospitalization. Adults, uh, a lot more are keeping their teeth. More people can eat apples and steaks because they don't have to have a full denture. Um, but that means there's a lifetime of maintenance and repair. Um, more teeth mean more gum disease. And over 50% of people over 55 years of age have moderate or severe gum disease. Uh, there's an increase in reported oral health problems over that period and inequality has increased as well. The good news is that prevention programs do work. Water fluoridation, um, programs such as Healthy Families, Healthy Smiles, Smiles for Miles, uh, fluoride varnish and early interventions. Next slide, thanks. So looking back at waiting times, uh, I know Matt's got more recent waiting times and um, they're included as well. But going back into the mid 80s, waiting times were about um, 30 months. They actually increased to the early 1990s when they reached up to five years. Then we had the CDHP and some of you will remember the Commonwealth Dental Health Program, which meant that waiting times reduced on average to 10 months. That program was axed in 97, and then you can see an increase in waiting times. And those um, points along the way show that, well, the lesson is that um, government interventions work. If you put more money into public dentistry, waiting times go down. So we had the 2004-05 budget increase. Um, that caused waiting times to go down. Then the NPA, as you know, is the National Partnership Agreement with the Commonwealth, caused waiting times to go down. There was a pause of that um, and waiting times have increased until COVID. I should just mention that what was really significant about the structure of dental public health was that in the early 1990s, community health centres in Melbourne uh, had dental clinics opening up. And before that time in Melbourne, it was really only the dental hospital where you could access um, dental care. So that was a significant event. Uh, next slide, thanks. So who's funding dental services in Victoria? It's mainly individuals. Um, in 2018-19, in it was 70% uh, of total dental services funding came from individuals. That's um, a lot higher than the national average, which is around 57%. And uh, it's, it's even higher still from the 20%, which is what individuals contribute to all health services. As far as the Victorian government, um, they're putting in about 
5% in that year, 2018-19. Again, the Victorian government contribution is lower than the national average of other jurisdiction government um, contribution. Over the last 25 years where there's really good data, um, the range for the Victorian government contribution varied between 5 and 12%. Uh, the Smile Squad, Smile Squad <laughs> funding will increase the Victorian um, proportion in, from 2020. As far as the Australian government's concerned, they put in about 11% um, in 2018-19. Uh, for the other jurisdictions, their contribution from the Australian government was about 15%. Uh, the Victorian range for the Australian government uh, contribution over the last 25 years has been between 3 and 11%. With the current, that 11% that goes into the Victorian funding, about half of that is for subsidising private health insurance, which mainly goes to better off people. So it's not really assisting in the public dental waiting time reduction. Uh, cost as a barrier to seeking dental care has increased. Um, so it's about a third in 2017. So more people are saying they don't visit for dental care because of cost. Next slide, thanks. So looking ahead, um, government interventions work. Um, we should be advocating to get a denticare type system, but also have Australian governments look at the commercial as well as the social determinants of oral health. So a sugar tax or levy, um, and particularly that sustained funding. I've got an asterisk there about advocacy, so supporting the Victorian Australian Health Alliance, but also there's an opportunity to lobby, lobby Labor now because um, it's looking as though they're going to stop their uh, 2019 election commitment, which was to a, a pension, a dental plan. And so if people can email the shadow minister, uh, Mark Buckler, to encourage Labor to continue to have uh, a public dental program. Quickly, the other areas we could look at, talk about later, implement the Victorian Action Plan to prevent oral disease, scale up preschool or oral health prevention programs, resolve dental practice software incompatibility, which is, is a bit of a drag on how quickly we can see people, must conduct a child oral health survey in 2022, and implement comprehensive workforce planning that relate to the actual needs of the population. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that's a, a, a great summary of where we are and how, despite improvements in dental health, there's um, been an increase in inequity uh, and how we address that will be, I think, a very important part of, of this panel. So next we have um, Matthew, um, Matthew Hopcroft to talk about, um, you know, more information about where we're at with, with data. So, um, Matthew just wanted me to say that, um, that he is the CEO of the Australian Dental Association Victoria, Victorian branch. Um, but I don't think I can not mention that Matthew also finished sixth place in MasterChef Australia in 2015, which is quite an incredible accomplishment. He's also very active in Twitter. It's actually how I know Matthew. So he's uh, a very in influential tweeter, probably the most influential dental tweeter that I've seen. Uh, and so definitely, um, I think people should, uh, anyone interested in this topic should should follow him. Um, so in terms of um, the next uh, slides we're going to see, uh, Matthew's going to present a, an overview of the latest data uh, and help us answer this question. So I'll give over to you, Matthew. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, hopefully you can see, see these slides. I'm having some Zoom problems over here. Uh, we obviously haven't paid our internet bill. Um, so I'm just going to hopefully flick through and John's stolen my thunder a little bit, but I, I like John's data. I'm going to have to get in contact with him and just extend the charts that I've got. But this is just some public dental waiting list data that we've been accumulating over a period of time. Looking in this 
chart here, what John was talking about, that average waiting time for general dental care. And what we've seen um, over the last nine years is, is a gradual increase, as John noted, um, a real decline down to under 12 months in 2013, 14, 14, 15, that linked in with that large boost in funding. And so there's a little hint there about what extra resourcing might be able to do. Um, but what we've seen, particularly in the last 12 months with the impacts of COVID and, you know, we've had dental practices restricted to virtually only emergency care for six months out of the last 18 months. Um, not surprisingly, those waiting times going up. But when you separate that data out um, and look at individual parts of the, of the state um, and, you know, maybe looking at some of the areas where disparities might be, regional and, and uh, um, rural parts of Victoria, um, some of those average waiting times are really, really high. So Maryborough, which has one of the highest um, average waiting times in the state, um, a few years ago was down at 22 months, which is still, in my opinion, outrageously high. Um, but now the average is up at, at, at 48 months. So that's a four year average waiting time for general dental care out in Maryborough. But parts of Melbourne, Mary Health, which is just around the corner from uh, where I live uh, up in Brunswick, uh, three year average waiting time up there. So a lot of parts of the state are well above that average. And then when you drill down a little bit more and you look at the, the longest waiting time for people on care, um, we're up now at around the 60 month mark. Uh, around parts of the state. And so again, going back to John's data and where we were um, back in the, in the 1980s and 90s um, with average waiting times of, of five years, there are parts of the state where, where that's the longest average waiting or the longest waiting time for people to access care. So average waiting time is one way that we can look at things. Um, but it's also interesting to look at how the system's resourced in, in terms of the throughput of the number of patients. And I think this one, shows us two things. I mean, the, the last data set there of the, the last financial year really shows us the impact of COVID. So in the year prior, we were seeing 400,000 patients a year through the public sector. That's about 250,000 adults and about 150,000 kids. Um, but last year that, that dropped off by more than 100,000. So it, that really demonstrates how COVID's impacted. But I think the other thing that's really important to note here is that really, the number of patients, the throughput in the system hasn't changed dramatically over the last seven or eight years. So we've got a system where, you know, we've got a state in Victoria where we've had reasonable population growth over the last 10 years. Um, we've certainly seen an increase in the number of people who are eligible for public dental services, but we're still seeing the same number of people that we were seeing five, six, seven years ago. And so I think that's an important point to note around how well the system's resourced. And, and you know, this is looking at uh, something like 2.5 million Victorians who are eligible for public dental services, about 1.5 million adults and about a million kids. Um, so 2.5 million and we're seeing about 400,000. And that's not surprisingly the consequence we see in terms of waiting lists. Um, and this then looks at the waiting list information. So the, the actual number of people as opposed to um, the time that people wait. And, you know, there are some issues that we might talk about data issues later on um, and concern about whether waiting time is, is necessarily the best way that we should be looking at things. Uh, but this, this shows us the number of people who are, who are actually on a waiting list. And again, we've seen quite a, a large increase over the last two years um, in, in growth of people on waiting lists. So as much as we're taking people off those waiting lists, um, people are coming back on again. And here I've just mapped out um, uh, quite handily by electorate for anyone who's interested in doing a little bit of advocacy and lobbying with their with their local um, Victorian uh, members of parliament. But the average waiting time at an electorate base, so the, the white dots are public dental clinics and you can see how well they're scattered or not scattered around Victoria as the case may be. Green for public dental waiting lists under 12 months. And when you think about, we you know, we talk about going and visiting the dentist every 12 months, um, but for higher risk people, potentially every six months for a dental visit. And given the vulnerable population that we're talking about in the public sector, um, you know, you would certainly want to be seeing people every six to 12 months to, to have the maximum impact from a prevention point of view. Very few green areas on the, on the map, lots of red in regional and, and rural areas. And we can just sort of zoom in to Melbourne a little bit. Um, and it's probably no surprise to anyone there where we're seeing a lot of red in the more vulnerable, disadvantaged communities, a little bit more green, um, and perhaps in some of the less 
disadvantaged communities and the white uh, are electorates that don't have a public dental clinic. Um, and so obviously people living in those areas having to, to travel um, to, to the nearest public dental clinic. So I, hopefully that paints a little bit of a picture of where we currently sit in terms of um, public dental waiting times, access to care, and, and I think some things for us to talk about um, as we go on for the rest of the, the rest of the session. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. And um, that, that's a crisis. So five years waiting list, 200,000 people on, um, on the wait list. And uh, that is all going to be made much worse by COVID if you weren't able to see 100,000 people that you would usually have seen last year. So, so that's, a, that's a lot. That was a lot, that presentation. And, um, you know, I think uh, finding ways to kind of cope with that creatively um, uh, will be extremely important. So I am really very interested uh, in, in learning more from our panelists. But first, um, the VOHA asked our public health providers to answer a question about the key things they would do to reduce dental waiting lists if they had more resources. Um, and here's what the IPC Health, uh, what IPC Health had to say. So we're just gonna see a little video. At IPC Health, we are leaders in public oral health services. As the largest service provider in the outer west of Melbourne, we provide dental services to the Brimbank, Hobsons Bay and Wyndham local government areas, or LGAs. Our LGAs are currently experiencing a major public oral health crisis, which is getting worse by the day, and we need the funding to fix it. Let's look at the problem. We have less than 50% of the public chairs required to support the demand. Our waiting lists for both adults and children are immense, wait times for general care and denture care are excessive, and we are in one of the fastest population growth corridors in metropolitan Melbourne. On top of this, COVID-19 service restrictions have caused a massive backlog of further delayed treatment. The impact is huge, with thousands of people in our community affected and many of those suffering. While clients are waiting, their health situation gets worse. Many patients require major work and often come to us experiencing pain, inflammation or infection. This poor oral health can impact their overall health due to related comorbidities including diabetes, cardiovascular disease and mental health problems. Our communities have a low socioeconomic background and a high culturally and linguistically diverse percentage and they rely on us for access to innovative and inclusive community health services and solutions. As one of the largest providers in Victoria, we are fully invested, but we can't do this alone. We need government funding to help manage the current crisis and COVID backlog. And we need sustainable and longer term funding models for our rapidly growing population. What if we had the government funding to enable our innovative solutions? IPC Health has a contemporary purpose-built eight room dental facility shell at our Wyndham Vale Superclinic campus we have committed capital expenditure to fit out the facility with the required infrastructure and equipment to make it operational. We are now seeking the required government funding to support the service delivery that our community so desperately needs. What if we could activate eight dental chairs at our Wyndham Vale campus, engage and support dental students with experienced supervisors? This would allow us to provide dental services to an additional 2,240 people per annum employ additional dentists and employ oral health therapists to provide comprehensive and culturally sensitive education, care and support for improved health literacy and oral care outcomes. With this funding, we could do all these things and support increased throughput and waitlist reduction, deliver patient-centred and value-based care, target at-risk populations and move from treatment to prevention. We need this government funding so we can create healthier communities together. Please contact us for more information. Well, that's a, that's a, both a, like distressing in terms of outlining the crisis for that area, but it, I think it's also inspirational in terms of how committed people are to, to making a difference within their communities and how, um, how creatively they're trying to approach this um, 
to 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 address the the needs. Um, so uh, let's let's hear from our next panelist, who similarly is uh, is a person who has been creatively uh, addressing the needs of her community for 30 years now. So uh, Dr. Uh, Ramani uh, Shankumar, who is a um, is the unit head of the Monash Health Dental Services and has been 30 years a public dental practitioner and at the forefront of health promotion and progressive services model in public health dentistry services and was the winner of the uh, Victoria Oral Health um, uh, Clinic of the Year uh, in uh, 2017, uh, Victoria Dental Clinic of the Year in 2017, which is a great achievement. Um, so, uh, Ramney, um, if you had to choose, what's the key thing you would do to reduce Victoria's waiting list? What, what, what do you think are the, the key things that would have a, an immediate impact? Sure. Um, thank you, Nancy, for that kind introduction. Uh, before I answer your question, I'd just like to thank John Rogers um, for being on the interview panel and selecting me for this job uh, 30 years ago. And uh, just, I was a single dentist at the time in the region, and I had uh, $120,000 funding and three-year wait list. Um, now, 30 years later, we got 30 chairs. Um, as you can see on maps, I think we have got 17,000 patients in the wait list still long wait list, but we had more capacity, more funding, yet the waiting time still continued to grow. Um, John's uh, slides brought a lot of memories. When the com Commonwealth funding withdrew, uh, I remember taking a busload of patients with the placards in front of the health minister's office and demanding the funding to stay. Uh, I was a rebel then. Uh, uh, then I um, think uh, also when the NPA funding was uh, introduced, um, our monitor staff, we worked together in partnership with the private dentists in the region and we brought a, a, a wait list to zero. And it was from over 10,000 to zero in six months in partnership. So with the funding, it is possible to bring the thing. But to answer your questions, I just like to say that um, currently we are seeing 23.2% of eligible population in the region. And out of that, 68.6% .6 are priority clients. In my belief, I think we eligibility criteria need to be reviewed and also priority groups to be revised. And it needs to be based on the risk assessment rather than the population group. We've done admonishments, we've done some um, uh, research on the refugee population, for example, and the data evidence can actually inform us on how this could be used on um, uh, deciding the priority groups. But I want to share one of the innovation. I think the answer to the question, funding is a prime example. Yes, we need more funding, but we need to think differently. We need to come up with an innovative way to approach waiting lists. Otherwise, we are, we are going to, 30 years later, we're going to still be in the same situation. So one of, I'm going to share some of the examples of innovation that we've undertaken at Bonish Health. One being a COVID screening clinic that we used. So it was interesting that you actually been working in the COVID and we have used the COVID screening clinic. Uh, it's, it's actually, we used one of the COVID screening clinic. Um, to um, um, uh, screen patients and assess them on the oral health risk as well as oral health education. So we invited about uh, 350 patients from my general wait list and we couldn't bring them in the clinic because of the social distance and other restrictions. So we used the drive-through model and um, we had 247 patients came in and within four hours, we saw more, all of them we did the risk assessment and it took seven to 10 minutes for each patient to be screened. When we did the patient experience, 92% said they were very happy with the experience because they didn't have to get out parking and all the other reasons. And also staff was very happy. They were able to help the um, community in this aspect. It was a very successful project. And uh, this project I will be sharing um, at the World Gender Congress in September this year. One other thing I want to talk about is empowering patients. We need to pay, uh, empower patients because we need to give some responsibility to the patients so they take care of their own health so they don't go and continue the same behavior and keep coming back and clogging the system. So one of the things we are undertaking at Monash Health is called Empower Model of Care. We are working with the denture patients where the denture patients are actually using the value-based care. Um, they are going and seeing oral health educators and having the 
individualized risk assessed and having oral health promotion uh, being tailored to those risks, as well as then they see the oral health therapies to have a hygiene component. And once they're done, patients will be told unless their gum health is improved, they will not be uh, receiving the dentures, as probably we know. Otherwise, when we give them the denture, if they don't improve, they go and lose more teeth and have more denture uh, teeth added to the denture, and eventually it will be a full denture. And it'll cost the um, um, government and the services much more on having to go through all that, as well as the patient will lose the teeth as well. So this is what we had trialed, and it's a wonderful experience. Patients, we got, initially, we thought patients will resist, but we got a lot of cooperation from patients, and uh, cl clinicians are very happy because they are seeing much um, um, uh, healthier uh, mouth, and they are then introducing the dentures in the mouth. So these are the two examples I wanted to share with you. And um, one other thing I think we need to look at is um, um, about putting mouth in back into the body. And uh, I think everybody talks and everybody wants it, but yet we have a different funding stream. We have different software. We have different funding model. Um, funding model is activity-based. Um, and that's very difficult, especially when uh, we are in dental services in the Monish Health. We work with acute, subacute, and community groups, but we can't see the other patients' other records when they're being referred to us. So there are a lot of barriers that need to be addressed. So I, I say let's aim for integrated oral health and help our patients to keep smile for life. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's a, a lot to think about and a lot of um, very innovative programs um, that, that you've been doing even really recently with, the, with uh, your COVID clinic conversion. Um, and I think, um, you know, certainly um, hearing this, it's, it's not like this isn't something I already knew, but um, definitely dental health is part of public health because this is just such an important thing in terms of its association with other diseases, but also the importance of, you know, having good teeth for, for living a healthy and productive life. Um, so uh, we are now um, going to hear from our, our panelist, uh, Tan Nguyen, uh, who's an oral health therapist and with, who specializes in dental public health and community engagement and advocacy with effective government governance. He was appointed to the Dental Board of Australia from 2018 to 2021 and has had leadership roles with Australian Dental and Oral Health Therapies Association and is the current co-convener for the Public Health Association of Australia Oral Health Special Interest Group. Um, and uh, so a specialist in prevention, which I think is a great follow-up uh, to Ramney's um, talks, uh, talk and suggestions. So a question for you, Tan, uh, where does prevention fit into this and how do we make sure we keep our eye on the big picture, keeping people's dental health, uh, optimizing people's dental health and um, managing the wait list in that way? So over to you. Thanks, Nancy. And um, I think, Ramney, you really... Um inspired uh, I think a lot of many people in terms of the um, the COVID screening clinic so it's really um, something that uh, I think a lot of people will take uh, attention to um, in terms of um, in terms of what I see and, and um, of course um, when we talk about prevention I also think of from a, a health economics perspective and it's a key part of my, my research work in my PhD because uh, whenever you think about uh, current uh, funding budgets everything is quite limited and so uh, whenever there's some funding, you know, we want to be finding out, you know, what is the best way to utilize that, that, that amount of money to provide the, the, the biggest impact. And one of them is not only ensure efficiency, for example, um, getting through a waiting list, but also to see value as well. Um, and so certainly um, um, in terms of increased funding is certainly important in the public dental sphere. Um, but we also need to consider other preventive interventions that might be helpful to uh, help with this work as well. And um, John mentioned this uh, earlier on in terms of one of the you know, biggest um, successes is around water fluoridation to reduce uh, tooth decay uh, for adults and children. Uh, and so when we talk about universal interventions beyond the dental clinic, it's something that we should be thinking about as well. So things like uh, a sugar tax has shown that reducing, has shown reduced consumption of sugar um, globally uh, for when interventions of that kind have been implemented. Um, and of course, there are other interventions that would be helpful to expand on, for example, programs that might look at, um, you know, being more uh, outreach programs, such as, you know, the COVID, you know, similar like a screening clinic, for example, that Rami mentioned, 
or targeted school-based programs in early childhood in school-based uh, programs. So um, important, yes, increased funding, absolutely. But um, we also need to be mindful how we can maximise the available budget to maximise impact. And I think that really that really brings it to the nut of this is trying to kind of think about having limited funds how do you maximize the benefit of it and we're getting some several questions in about that so i think that that's going to be a part of what we uh what we speak uh about in the remainder of the panel um so then uh, i'd like very much to hear from sandra anderson who is a member of the community advisory committee of um, dental health services uh, victoria Sandra is a registered volunteer at the University Hospital Geelong. She volunteers on the Barwon um, Southwestern Integrated Cancer Services and the North, uh, Northern Community Advisory Committee. Um, she recently completed her certificate in consumer leadership with the Health Issues Center and, and certificate in consumer advocacy training at the Cancer Action Victoria. She has more than, more than 31 years experience in planning, community development and implementation and was awarded the National Volunteer Award for long-term commitment to community services. So I, I think that this is an excellent chance to you know bring in um, the, the, the the patient uh, and advocate voice to this which is you know obviously from Ramney's experience with bringing people to with their pickets um, extremely uh, and sadly important um, in, in this area so um, so I will um, hand it over to you Sandra with the question is how do consumers feel about this problem how do long waiting lists affect them uh, and what do they want to see done what, from a consumer perspective, um, you know, is going to be a workable solution here? So over to you. Thank you, Nancy. He hello to everybody. Uh, before I came to this webinar today, I did speak to a few of the consumers um, people and some of their answers will come out in the answers that I'll give today. One of the questions was how do consumers feel about waiting lists? And I mean, of course, consumers are not happy. You know, they, they get told on they're on the waiting list for um, you know 12 months, two years, but of course they realise then that that could that could go out to two, three, four years, and especially with the COVID the way it is at the moment, um, you know they get a little bit disheartened when that sort of thing happens. Um, how do long waiting lists affect cus, uh, consumers? Waiting lists affect, affect the people because sometimes they have severe problems. They don't really know about these problems until the pain affects them. And by that stage, um, it's, it's too late or it, it's actually too late for the teeth that they're trying to, to save. And it's actually a big burden then on the health system. It makes it a little a longer and um, worse and a longer treatment for that particular person and harder on the dentists. Um, remember consumers needing partial and full dentures um, are also on these waiting lists. And to remember that, um, you know, I know that it's right from the children to adults that are on the waiting list, but people are living longer nowadays. So people are needing, you know, to keep their teeth as long as they possibly can before needing dentures. Uh, what would consumers want to see done? I suppose that comes down to if we had an abundance of funding, um, you know, we could probably bring back some of those things that John was talking about before, some of those successful programs um bring back some of the maybe you know the voucher program so people can use their own local dentists um thus making the waiting list shorter uh, we know COVID closures are only making waiting lists longer but that really is beyond totally beyond our control but i think we also need to look at more education as needed for the the prevention and reduction of oral health diseases you know, there's a lot of people out there that um, embarrassed even to open their mouths when they're, they're doing anything because they need something done with their teeth. You know, I know a lot of people, the first thing that you look at when you're looking, talking to a person is their mouth. Uh, a lot of people look at their eyes, a lot of people look at their mouth, but a lot of people won't open their mouth and talk. So it is a sheer embarrassment to consumers with, with, with oral health diseases and things like that. So thank you, Nancy. Thank you, and, and that's a very, very powerful statement, and I, and I think is part of why we're all here in terms of the importance of, uh, of good oral health in terms of people's really ability to thrive. Um, 
So one of the things we want to make sure, uh, Ramini, to, to Ramini, we want to clarify your, your COVID screening clinic was just taking advantage of people who are already attending for getting a COVID test and was uh, opportunistic in terms of that because there were some questions about, you know, who was coming, the four reasons to leave your house, et cetera. So maybe I could have you comment just a little bit on that. Sure. Um, it was conducted when there was no restrictions, but and the COVID screening um, uh, clinics were quieter. We utilized that opportunity to bring our patients um, because we still had social distance restrictions within our clinical waiting areas. So we used that open area and using the COVID clinic screening. A screening clinic. But we were talking about having shared uh, time so that they will do it in the morning and we'll do it in the afternoon when there's no busy times, but I'm still waiting for that time to come. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Uh, yes. Fingers crossed it will be soon. Um, that would be uh, fantastic. Um, so one of the, there's some questions here about who else could be engaged to provide oral health education? So there are, are there other professionals who could receive some training so we could, you know, get oral health messages and instructions and education out without um, further, um, further burdening this already kind of overburdened system? Um, what do people think? Tan, what do, you, what do you think about that, about engaging other professionals in terms of oral health education? Uh, thanks, Nancy. Um, I mean, other panels would probably uh, have other ideas as well, but uh, in terms of some of the research and, um, you know, we've seen um, uh, other health professionals, so non-dental professionals being involved in oral health promotion. So we've already seen that as, um, as John mentioned with the uh, Healthy Families, Healthy Smiles, where we have um, nurse, uh, nurses and maternal child health nurses. We also have midwives uh, involved as well. Uh, a lot of work being done uh, from New South Wales in oral health promotion um, and the use of a flu advantage, which is a, a medicament that helps to prevent uh, tooth decay um, as well. So those sort of things are certainly being, um, being uh, a key things that um, we want to expand on. Currently in Australia, it's not, I guess, a national rollout at this stage, but there's certainly scope to expand on that and utilize the non-dental professionals uh, in this space. So kind of expanding on, on that, um, you know, thinking about other ways in terms of uh, in prevention. Um, you know, Matthew, I know that you're involved in sugar-free smiles uh, and we have, you know, a question about how realistic would a, a, a sugar tax be? You know, maybe it would be better in Victoria where there is less influence of sugar lobbies, uh, maybe not so much in Queensland, but, but how could that be enacted and how could that, that help not just the improve, you know, uh, oral health in general, but be, be used to really strengthen um, the public health dentistry system? It's a really, really good question, Nancy. Thanks. Um, that the whole sugar tax debate's been one that's that's ongoing for you know a long time now, and and we've spent a lot of time trying to work with um, other people in the in that sort of sugar health space, particularly around diabetes and obesity, where that whole conversation started. But as we know from our, our data, and as as John said, you know one in three kids have tooth decay by the age of five to six, and it's the leading cause of preventable hospitalisation. So there's a really strong argument to use oral health within that, that broader picture. Um, there's no political will for it in this country and, and it makes things really, really difficult. But it's a conversation I think we need to keep having because it helps to um, inform the public that every time we talk about it, it's, it's actually sending a, a powerful health promotion message about how, how bad sugar is for you. Um, on the question of Queensland versus um, Victoria, I mean, clearly a, a sugar tax would have to be implemented at a, at a national level, I would, I would think. Um, but the interesting thing, you know, there's this concern in Queensland where, you know, most of, I think, you know, 90% of sugar is grown, about 10% in, in northern New South Wales. The majority of our sugar is actually exported. Um, and so if you, if, you, if you sort of crunch the numbers on it and you figure out how much sugar that's produced in Australia actually finds its way into sugar-sweetened beverages, and then if you put a, a tax on that, it would have virtually no impact on the, on the sugarcane industry in Queensland. So there's a bit of a scare campaign that runs there. But... One of the things we've been talking about is, is funding um, and, and resourcing of, of public health. Um, clearly, something like a sugar tax would, would help to drive um, some additional resourcing that can go towards health promotion campaigns, it can go towards treatment. Um, and so it's, you know, it's something that we definitely need to keep talking about. 
So there, there, there are questions coming in about, you know, inequities and prioritization. Obviously, how do we use the funds that we have um, as best we can? And um, it's interesting, there, there are questions coming up talking about how we prioritize children and older groups, um, you know, the children in terms of setting them up for uh, a healthy um, dental life, a healthy oral health for the rest of their lives. But then, you know, about there being, you know, older people who really don't necessarily advocate as heavily for their own care and may end up on very, very long wait lists and how that can impact on their lives as well. These are obviously very difficult problems. Um, John, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on prioritizing how we use the, the funds we have? There's also a question about, you know, what we fund in terms of maximizing the benefit to as many people as possible. So I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts about that. Uh, it, it look, it's yeah, appropriate to look at what to do with limited resources. And to a certain extent, there will always be limited resources. Uh, I think we, we we must advocate for more more resources. It's it, it's very clear what the problems are. Uh, one of the issues seems to be that um, people getting toothache uh, are interested in oral health um, when they don't have that problem themselves. There's other things that become more important. So. I think a broader advocacy from those of us who know the extent of the issues. Um, certainly working with other professionals is, is, is key and um, trying to find oral health champions with uh, other uh, professional groups, health, welfare, education groups. Um, I think it's important to um, consider all those opportunities to add the oral, you know, where, where can we add oral health as an issue? So for those um, health uh, programs where they're screening um, Aboriginal groups, older persons groups, aged care assessment teams, we've got to work to get an oral health prompt uh, and a, an oral health question. So it's about prevention. It's about getting more people involved in advocacy, I think. Yeah, I mean, there seems to be kind of an inherent, you know, real just lack of funding to this system. And, and that's kind of just the overarching problem uh, or one of the main ones. Um, so, um, Remini, in response to that, some of, the, some of the people were commenting on your system of, you know, creating um, uh, a, a plan for people related to how they're caring for their own oral health and, you know, it's, you know prioritizing for specific care based on that. Um, so uh, like, why don't you take, take a, you know, a, a minute or so to kind of expand on that, expand on your thoughts about how that could, could be applied more widely and uh, what the benefits in terms of, you know, being able to deliver more care to more people or target it um, have been. Sure. Um, I think um, at Manish Health, we've actually started doing, using some oral health risk assessment, but the risk factors, it could start from patient level. So I'm actually looking at um, thinking like um, it's statewide, we can do it um, telehealth, we can introduce a telehealth and trying to address, um, if I've been given a choice, I would get down the wait list to zero and then any entry afterwards, I would have them under risk assessment, have telehealth through uh, um, first part uh, with the oral health educators and then having intraoral risk assessed. And based on those risks, then we actually categorize them into groups. That's exactly what we did at the screening. So we used ICDAS, which is an international caries detection um, assessment system, and which is widely used internationally. So we use that system in identifying and then uh, depending on the score, we then come up with a management plan. We used the literature and we also had very vigorous clinical discussion group and came up with this possible and it needs to be tested and that can be incorporated statewide and possibly nationally, I'm not sure, but that's something that we need to undertake and looking at making risk assessment and then uh, looking at um, uh, giving priority based on risk class rather than population group or the broader population group. And just touch base on working 
with the other groups and we are very fortunate in Monash Health. We've been working with the multiple pro providers in the region and also recently I've attended a, a community practice where they were talking about older people and frailty, frailty and how um, uh, oral health is also seemed to be an interesting issue there. So we need to be able to get everyone in the think and Monash Health, we are you know, partnering with all the parties in the region and educate them, empower them because dental clinical staff itself won't be enough to empower and educate. So we need to broader uh, use the broader population, broader stakeholder group. Thank you. Well, and this is a great segue to bring Sandra in. Um, so just in terms of how that is done. So if we're talking about prioritizations, which obviously happen every day in these dental clinics because you have so many people waiting to be seen, how, how do you prioritize these folk and, and how do you use risk assessments in ways that don't increase inequities? Uh, I'd be very interested to hear what your opinions are uh, as a leading consumer advocate. I think most of the um, problem can, can actually stem from your, your local GP. I just think that your local GP needs to be one of the people that you need to be continually talking to about, you know, everything, your diabetes, your oral health, you know, your blood, your di um, everything else that's got to do with it. If they're the ones that pick that sort of thing up, then they're the ones that can actually start educating you and saying, you know, you've got some problems, you know, your alcohol's not helping. Do you smoke? That's not helping you at all either. So I think one of the, the, things that we need to do is look at the, and like Ramani said, you know, you can't just go with just the dental people. You have to go outside of that and get some um, professional support and, and help with for consumers and for everybody. And that's a, you know, again, like this, this, this thinking of oral health as health, uh, I think is, is really just a, an essential part of that. Um, and, um, uh, so, so such an important point to mention. Um, Tan, lots of questions continuing about prevention and what we can do in terms of better prevention. Um, and, um, you know, some of the things related to um, just access to care and uh, trying to um, find ways to deal with all these priority groups, really so very many. Um, so any, any last thoughts about prevention and, and how we can enhance our prevention even with the limited resources that we have? Uh, thanks, Nancy. Um, I think the, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, you know, we, we do have uh, no, you know, what works what works well in terms of the prevention space. And I think the key thing that's been a focus of my work is, is actually that while we focus on prevention for my PhD is really to, um, you know, we found that the implementation of prevention isn't often routinely applied in practice. And so an example I give is um, the use of fluid varnish, which um, I think even um, everyday consumers may not be familiar with what fluid varnish is. Um, and it, that's had have demonstrated clinical benefits, not only economically, um, it can uh, drive costs down because you're preventing oral disease. Um, but I think some of those messages in how we can apply the risk assessment is really important and apply a management plan because, you know, if you're waiting for patients to come to you at a dental clinic, um, most patients may only attend for a problem, uh, which is often the case when you go to GP practice, for example, for medical issues. Um, and so um, it is trying to find what, what works best in terms of being able to be proactive in uh, addressing prevention. Um, and also for practitioners as well, I think um, practitioners, uh, dental practitioners in particular, uh, there, there is probably um, a number of interventions that we might be doing right now that might actually not have any value for patients. So that's something that really requires a radical shift in how we understand how to not only manage disease because um, oral health is a, is a chronic disease, um, but um, uh, in the main, we've tried to sort of dealt with oral diseases as being really acute issues rather than a chronic disease management process. Mm. And, it is and a very so, different yeah. way to think of dental health. John, yes? Could I just say, we do have a, a prevention plan for oral health in um, Victoria. Uh, the, Victorian Action Plan to Prevent Oral Disease 2020-2030 that looks at orally healthy environments, it looks at the range of evidence-based um, interventions uh, we've got. And importantly, it includes targets that um, 
the government should be held accountable to, and that looks at the proportion of children entering uh, school with cavities and so on. So um, we, we have got those uh, evidence-based initiatives and I, th I would encourage people to just Google Victorian Action Plan for uh, oral, um, oral disease. Terrific. Um, and uh, how we hold our politicians accountable will be very important too. And, um, you know, it'd be kind of really key to get consumer stakeholder groups uh, with, uh, with people like Sandra involved. Matt, you had a question? You had... Um well, I just, I just, a comment, I guess, and you know, we, I think we really need to focus on reframing the narrative a little bit. We've talked a lot about innovation and working within existing um, limited funding, and I think that that's really the crux of of this whole matter. And, and you said, Nancy, you know, oral health is health, um, and yet we're working within a system that's rationing care at a really extreme level, um, and we don't expect any other any other patient in this state to wait. 22 months on average or 58 months uh, at that longest wait for any other health problem. Um, not that I'm aware of, but that's what we're accepting in dentistry. And it's, it's just simply not good enough. And innovation is really important. And, uh, you know, it's great to hear all of these fantastic ideas that people have. And it's, and it's really important. My concern is sometimes is that if, if we focus on innovation, really we're tinkering around the edges and we're not, we're not going to fix the problem because no amount of the innovation that, we, that we're talking about at the moment is going to shift dramatically where we're at. And John demonstrated that really nicely with, with the data. Every time we have a large injection of funds, um, we see a large improvement in the waiting times and we would see if we were able to collect the data, um, some improvement in oral health outcomes, which is what we're, we're trying to achieve. Um, and I, I get concerned sometimes that, you know, we might end up with innovation depending on who's driving it. Um, you know, there's, there's a few of us that probably remember as kids going to see the dentist in a school dental van and probably some of us that used to work in those school dental vans um, and probably for very good reason they disappeared. Um, but now they've come back and instead of us putting money into somewhere where we can actually treat um, people who need care, we've, we've spent money on a, on a, bunch of vans to deliver care to kids that were already receiving care. The problem that we're seeing at the moment is really around adults accessing care. There was a comment in there about the child dental benefit schedule and, and you know, are we underutilizing that? We're definitely underutilizing that. And I think we need to spend a lot more time promoting that so that we can get kids seen wherever they need to seek care. Um, Sandra made the point about using vouchers. You know, we've 85% of our workforce is in the private sector. Um, I think we need to look at some innovation about how we utilize that workforce a little bit better as well. Those are some great uh, kind of summary comments. Um, and thank you very much, uh, Remini, do you? Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to touch base about the Smart Squad program and having been uh, part, take part in the part, proof of concept and been having clinicians going to the school, we are actually seeing a lot of new children in the school where they would have not come into the clinic. So we feel great or that we are able to go and reach out to those uh, children who would have not come to our clinics. And it's a great program and it's with the prevention and value-based care um, uh, principle. It's working really well from my perspective. And um, I do agree uh, with Matt. Yes, uh, we do need to add, um, approach this in a multiple uh, strategies. Uh, additional funding. Yes, we are having two brand new hospitals coming in, Pakenham Hospital and Cranman Hospital. But we need our operational funds to go along to address the waiting times uh, as well. So we need funding. We need at the same time innovative waves. We need to empower patients. We need to collaborate and integrate with the other people. So multiple strategies for us to be able to reduce the waiting times and then maintain the waiting times low, uh, low, uh, um, um, low all times, so sustain. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there's, there's obviously a, a lot we could talk about. We could talk a long time about this because there are so many issues. Clearly, we need um, to um, bring in the community in terms of advocacy because, you know, funding does seem to be fundamental to this. There are a lot of things that could be done, but we can't even get the basics that we want done because there's just enough, not enough money to serve the need. And that, that's very sad because, you know, 
oral health is health. And you're right, Matt, that we would not accept this in any other part of healthcare. Um, so why is it acceptable? Uh, because it's your teeth. It's just, it's just not, um, not right. So we haven't had time to get to everyone's questions uh, and apologies for that, but I think this has been you know, a fantastic um, discussion and a, a terrific, very terrific panel. Um, so I, I appreciate all the panelists for their um, for their uh, interactions to uh, Julie and Katie who um, helped to organize this. Uh, um, really, thanks very much for this. And I'm gonna hand over to Tony for some last words and kind of a wrap up. Okay, thanks Nancy. Uh, so a really interesting um, session, uh, lots of interesting questions. I'm actually going to suggest to Voha that uh, we start, we answer a range of them in the next newsletter. Um, because I think there's a whole lot of really interesting points raised, and I think it would be a valuable uh, discussion we could start there. If you want to get the newsletter and you don't already get it, uh, you can go to our website, uh, voha.org.au, or just Google Victorian Oral Health Alliance, and you'll get there. Uh, and you can subscribe to the newsletter, which comes out every couple of months or so. And we're about to put a, an edition out after this, uh, this event, uh, and it'll also talk about our advocacy in terms of the federal election, uh, where we've prioritised two issues. One is a senior dental benefits schedule, the need to introduce that as recommended by the Royal Commission. And secondly, uh, a more sustainable funding model from the federal government. Uh, so I'd like to add my thanks too to, uh, to Nancy for, um, for chairing this and to all the panellists for adding all the range of... Um, uh, interesting points and answering those questions so well. I can hear a, a torrent of applause there out there <laughs> in the ether. So thank you for all that. Um, thank you to the team uh, that organised this, um, Julie, Katie, Matt, Tan, uh, and Yelena and T from the Melbourne Dental School. It's been great to have, uh, as I said before, a partnership. Uh, go to our website, subscribe. If you're an organisation that shares some of our values and passion for a more equitable oral health system in Victoria, public system, um, you can join as an organisation. Again, there's details on the website how to do that. So thanks everyone for coming. Uh, let's all endure this lockdown together uh, and but keep our eyes on the horizon. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye everyone.